so, so I was asked. I was asked by the organisers to give some kind of. I mean, this is not a. Don't expect to see a technical exposition of the mod p reduction of a of a Shimura curve here. Uh, this is a, a a general overview. And in fact, I mean, I prepared something, and I don't know. It didn't seem very good, and I ripped it up, and I prepared something else, and I, I looked at it this morning, and it's and it's I. I don't know. It's, I'm actually going to say, in some sense, I'm going to say very little about Fermat's last theorem. But I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm just going to, I'm going to waffle for an hour. Uh, <laughs> so, so but before I start, let me just, I'll, I'll say my bit. So, so I was an undergraduate and a graduate at Cambridge in the UK, a student of Richard. And, and in fact, when I approached him to be my thesis advisor, he said, you should go, you should go to the US. You should, you should go abroad. And I said, oh, I don't want to go abroad. Because... Uh, uh, per, sort of personal reasons. This is, yeah, ultimately, that, that might have been a mistake, I don't know. But uh, I stayed in the UK, and it turned out I, I'd chosen a very good advisor. And uh, after three years, four years, uh, he said it again. He said, you, you've just really got to go abroad. And uh, I uh, came here. And I think in, in Cambridge, they really kind of give you the impression that Cambridge is really, you know, that kind of the best place, the center of the universe for, for mathematics, for everything. And the moment... I got here, I realized how completely wrong that was somehow. And, and it was, you know, had I not listened to my advisor, had I stayed, I might still be completely, completely in the dark. And I arrived here and, you know, so Ber this, this is 95, 95 to 97. And Berkeley was just an amazing place. And, you know, Ken was giving it, Fermat's last theorem had just been proved. And Ken was giving this huge, you know, 33 lectures or something on, on Wiles' proof. And the room was full of, I mean, you know, I thought well, there was lots of graduate students in Cambridge. You know, I, there, I'd, I'd, there was, Taylor had three other students, and you know, there was a couple of others. All, you know, at six, six of us number theorists. And and I came to Berkeley, and the room is just full. There's number theorists. You know, just just the, the room is full of graduate number theorists. And, and these aren't just random people that you know were doing a PhD. They were going to leave. This was Bill Stein, and you know, and, and I guess Frank Caligari showed up soon after, and, and Matt Baker, and lots of other people that have gone to become, had gone to become professional. Mathematicians, and yeah, we were all just sitting there listening to, you know, to Ken giving a really detailed explanation of, you know, lots of lots of interesting stuff, and it was, it was, you know, it was great. It really opened my eyes in lots of ways. And in fact, one of, one of the things it taught me was when I went back after two years, I went back to England. And I somehow left Cambridge very soon afterwards <laughs> <laughs> because I realised that there were, I realised that there were actually other places in the universe, and uh, and I went to London. I've been there ever since, and uh, somehow. In some sense, Ken was at least partially responsible for, for opening my eyes. So, so, I, so let me, uh, so let me talk about. So I'm going to do the same as Barry. I'm not going to. I'm not going to get technical. I just want to give some kind of overview of the, the thing that the, the thing that Ken did in, in the in, in his Inventiones paper from, from the mid '80s, from from '87. The paper in Inventiones is 100, uh, where he proved this kind of crucial result that opened the door for the for Fermat's last theorem to be proved. <coughs> And, uh, and I'm going to try and put it into some kind of context. And the, the context I'm going to put it into will very much, actually, I've realized going through the talk, will very much reflect the kind of mathematics I'm thinking about nowadays, I, I think, rather than anything else. So it's not going to be the standard talk that everyone saw 100 times in 1994. So. But on the other hand, it's still it's not going to be too technical. So let, let me start off with a, with a map. Let me, let me start off with a, with a non-constant morphism of Riemann surfaces. So there's a map there, so a non-constant morphism of, of, of compact Riemann surfaces. Uh, and uh, so this map will have some kind of degree. And, and if, you have, if, you choose, if you choose a generic uh, little, little y in capital Y, then, then phi inverse of y Will be, will be d distinct points. I mean, that's this is a the. the I did learn the theory of compact Riemann surfaces in Cambridge. And it was a very <laughs> nice and tidy course, and I was very impressed by it. So I, do, I don't want to knock Cambridge completely. Told me lots of great things. I learned the best proofs of Sulos theorems you'll ever see. And uh, <laughs> so, so um. So the, the generic, a, 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 random, a randomly chosen point in, on the, 
uh, in Y will ha we'll have D distinct preimages, but there's a, there'll be a finite bad set. So, but, but typically, uh, there will be a there will be a finite, almost always non-empty, non-empty set. Bad, bad set S. Of, uh, of points of y uh, such that such that phi inverse of s for s and s uh, will have size less than d if you if you count it in the naive way of course so I, I don't know if you so an example would be if these were just projective one space and this was just this was just z goes to z squared. And of course, a, a generic number will have two square roots, but infinity only has one square root, and zero only has one square root. And so the, the bad set in this case would be zero and infinity. And, but of course, as mathematicians, you know from an early age, you realize when you're trying to solve quadratic equations that in fact, the preimage of zero really isn't zero. It's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's really, Z, I mean, you know, the roots of the roots of z squared equals zero is zero with multiplicity two, right? And if you're sensible, if you're sensible and you count with multiplicities, so there's a more, you know, if if you don't think naively and set theoretically, if you if you think more carefully, then you see that there's we can do better. If we want to measure, if we want to measure how bad this map phi is, we can do better than this set s. So so a finer invariant than s. See, if I just talk, if we forget about phi and x and we just knew y, then if I give you s. You'll have a real job reconstructing phi, but uh, I can somehow give you so a finer. So we could have so S equals the you know the bad set in living in Y. So a better invariant somehow. I mean, if we if we if we count multiplicities, if uh, if if somehow E of X, if E of X for X in X. Is the uh, is the multiplicity? Uh, is the multiplicity of x in the set? In this, if I, I look at the preimage of the image, as it were. So I map x down and then I pull back again. I'm going to get x with some multiplicity. Then e x will generically be one. Uh, then we could uh, then we could consider then for for uh, we can do a little bit better than the set s. Then for s in s we can consider. Let's say the sum for x in x, such that phi of x equals s, we could kind of consider, say, e of x minus 1. I'll, I'll, I'll take away 1 because then this will, uh, you know, this, this, this is a number which is typically 0, you see, that's the point. If I, if I look at e of x, then I'll get a number which is typically d, but if I, if I take away 1, I'll get a number which is typically 0. Uh, so that, there's a number there, and somehow that's telling us, that's telling us much more, right? That's telling us. That's, that's telling, it's, it's a much finer invariant than just the bad set S itself. It's telling us, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's really, it's telling us much more about the, about the ramification. It's certainly not telling us everything, but it's, but it's still telling us a great deal. So now we could consider, I mean, if I, if I just call that C of S there, and we can now consider this sum of the sum for S in S of C of S times S. This is now a divisor. This is a divisor on y, and it's got much more information, you know, which is somewhere holding much more information. Uh, about, about phi than, than just the set S. It's a, it's a, much, it's a much finer invariant. Well, no, and of course, we could, you know, we could, we could attempt to get even finer invariants, but I'm, I'm going to stop there, but uh, in talking about compact Riemann surfaces. So this is a phenomenon that we see in number theory a lot. So here's a kind of a number theoretic version of this. So I, I, maybe I should say, for people who are wondering if I'm just going to do this kind of thing for now, I'm going to spend about another five more minutes kind of doing kind of undergraduate like waffle, and then I'm going to push on a little bit. So, so there's a number theoretic kind of counterpart to this. Uh, so a number theorist might consider a, a ring like the integers. That's a, <laughs> Uh, it's a much more number theoretic gadget than a compact Riemann surface, and this, of course, we can. 
this, a, a natural generalization of the integers would be the ring of integers in a number field. So I consider a, I could consider a ring like zero. I've been here, been here under 24 hours. I'm already saying z. If you consider rings like z root seven, and it's a terrible thing that's happening to me. Uh, we could consider rings like z root seven, and and the count. And I mean, you know, for those of you that know what's going on, I, I really want to think about the spectrum of this, the sort of prime ideals of this. If I look at a prime ideal here, its intersection with z will be a prime ideal down here. So I'm getting a map. You know, it's, it's not more than a formal analogy. Uh, there really is a geometric object here mapping down to a geometric object here, and uh, and to consider the pre-image of a, a pre-image of a point down here, I need to factorize it. So Z so contains a number like, thinks of a number which is of the form a squared minus 7b squared. Z contains numbers like 29, uh, which, is a, which is a prime number down here. Uh, but, but 29 is not a prime number here, because 29, if I've got it right, 29 in, in Z root 7, so this is the things of the form a plus b root 7 with a and b integers, 29 factors as 6 plus, 6 plus root 7 times 6 minus root 7. So there's a. So there's. So this this used to be this used to be prime, but up here it's it ceased to be prime, and it's the product of two distinct prime. These you know these are distinct prime numbers. So here, distinct, <coughs> distinct primes. But but the key the key thing is not that it's factor, but that these primes are distinct. These are distinct prime numbers, and so you know geometrically the preimage of one point has become two points, but it's become two distinct points, and the reason I've chosen. Uh, so, so there's an obvious candidate for a prime ideal down here, who's pre so when you factorize it here, it's, it's not square free. The point is that 20, 29 isn't prime anymore, but it's still square free. But of course, Z contains the number 7. And up here, no longer, Z is not only not prime, I have trouble with, if I start making elaborate sentence constructions, I'm going to get in trouble with BC, so I've got to be careful. So 7 is not only not prime, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, not even square free either. 7 becomes, 7 is root 7 squared. Uh, and so, so geometrically, there's a, if, I, if I'm thinking of a prime here as a point, then the pre-image with the point is, 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 you see the same things happen. It's one point with multiplicity 2. And uh, so 7 is, a bad, 7 is a bad prime in this situation. 7 was ramified. And... Uh, and a good measure, so a measure for the uh, a measure for the badness uh, for the badness of primes here, of primes in this situation, uh, one measure would be the discriminant, uh, and that's going to be the one R. Uh, would be would be the discriminant. of z root 7. And uh, the way we compute the discriminant of this thing, of this, is this, uh, this ring, is uh, we observe that uh, it's generated over z by a root of x squared minus 7. So we need to compute the discriminant of x squared minus 7. And that's b squared minus 4ac. So it's 28 there. So 28, 28 is the analog of this. Uh, this sum, remember, sum for s in the bad set. We, did, we don't just remember the bad set. We remember the bad set plus some, plus some positive integer that goes with every element of the bad set. And 28 is kind of 2 squared times 7. And so the idea is that 7 is behaving badly because it's occurred. But actually, now, now we see it, we actually see that 2 might actually be behaving worse because 2, because two has appeared in this discriminant. Uh, and in fact, the, the multiplicity of 2 is 2. So 2 is actually a little bit worse than 7. And Lo and behold, one can check that uh, one can one can check that even though it's much, somehow in some sense less obvious than the behaviour of seven, one can check that two actually becomes up here. It becomes a three plus root seven squared times times a unit, and the and the, and the unit is is uh, eight minus three root seven. Uh, so you shouldn't worry about the unit. The, the the unit is a divisor of one. It's a phenomenon we don't see down here. So the idea is that u u times u times 8 plus 3 root 7 is actually equal to 1. So this is a divisor of 1. So when we look at the ideals generated by everything, we, we don't see the unit at all. Uh, 
And again, we see that 2, two, is, two is somehow not, not, not square free. So 2 is behaving badly. So we have the notion of a discriminant uh, measuring the badness of a situation in, in number theory. This is unusable, isn't it? Unless you're kind of 12, 12 foot. Yeah. So, <laughs> just jump. <laughs> White men can't jump. I, I didn't bring my sneakers because I don't own them. Uh, so so what, we've, what we've just seen in this rather waffly introduction is uh, so we've seen the notion. So in number theory, so the, the conclusion we get, uh, so I'm going to so beef it up a little bit after this. So the conclusion is in number theory and, and in many other places, so sometimes there's a bad set, so sometimes There's a bad set of primes, and and one measure of one measure of an object would be the bad set. Uh, but you see, uh, much better than and uh, much better than uh, so a, a bad set of primes. You know, uh, I mean, sometimes an object, ha if you like, sometimes an object has a bad set of primes. And then most naive invariant one can attach to the object would be that set. And, uh, and, and, but one can sometimes do better. One can uh, sometimes attach not just that set of primes, but possibly you know, uh, yeah, some, some kind of a, a positive integer n, which is the product for p in the bad set of p to the power, you know, some C of P uh, to, you know, to the object. And this, uh, and this thing here, this positive integer n, is, is a better invariant than the bad set, you know, which is, a, you know, measuring. So where, where CP, where CP is some kind of indication, is an indicator of how bad P is. So that's the, the moral of the, first, of the first 20 minutes of the lecture. Uh, and I should say there's some standard terminology. Maybe I should say instead of, I mean, some, some kind of notation that comes up. One talks about P is, P is unramified. Uh, if, if, if P isn't in the bad set. And I, and I should also say that we'll see examples later or at least I'll mention examples later, where even attaching a positive integer might not be such a good idea, and one might, one might really want you know, somehow finer invariants. Uh, you know, you know, in this generality, it's impossible to somehow phrase, phrase what one wants, but you know, one wants to have some kind of measure of badness, how, how bad a prime is. And in number theory, the case is, it's almost always the case that all the finitely many primes are going to be good, and then the bad ones could be in some sense, arbitrarily bad. And we need to, it's nice to have some kind of measure of how bad things are. And this C of P is, is, our, first, you know, is our first step. So C P is going to be an integer at least one, you see. Uh, and the, these, integer, these integers n, well, we've seen an example, but typical words for them are things like discriminant and, and other things that we'll see will be conductor or level. These are, these are words that... These are words that come up, but somehow all, I mean, they're not quite the same thing in some sense, but they're all conveying, conveying similar information. So, so let me talk about the, some of the, the mathematical, uh, the, math the mathematical landscape where Ken made, Ken made one of the, you know, one of his, one of his several serious contributions to mathematics. Uh, but let me, let me talk about one of them. So this is a, uh, you know, this is somehow the world of the worlds of automorphic forms and gamma representations. So here's so here we have two worlds. We have this kind of analytic. Uh, so here, here let's let's talk about the world of modular forms. Then. So re I mean, really, I'm talking about normalized cuspidal new eigenforms. But let me let me let me just just leave modular forms as some as the catchphrase here. So there's some there's some world here. That was somehow 
these are these are these are analytic functions, right? This is this is you know this is this is very much in the at least if you if you go back a hundred or so years, then these guys very much lived in the world of analysis. These are holomorphic functions, functions on the upper half plane. Half plane. And, uh, and maybe I should say, well, while we're here, the upper half plane, one can actually think about it as GL2 of R, modulo O2 of R, R star. Yeah, something I learned in Cambridge. That very, very important thing. Uh, so there's a, I, I shouldn't have put that there. Let me, let me put that here. Let, let me put it down here. GL2 of R, modulo O2 of R, times R star. Uh, so there's... There's the world of modular forms, and, and, and they've become, there are many more interpretations of these gadgets now, but, but you know, properly the original definition, when people ran across these as examples of holomorphic functions of the above plane that had very interesting properties, and Barry, Barry already mentioned a few, and then really, I, I don't think it's unfair to say that there's this, there's this huge chasm now. There's a big gap. And over here, we have, and over here we have something much more algebraic, we can have sort of two-dimensional, I mean, I guess, two-dimensional representations. Representations of, the, of, the, of, a, of, a, of a Galois group. Uh, let's just say of Galois groups. I mean, really, specifically, I guess, if I'm talking about classical modular forms, I would really be interested in the group Gal Q R over Q. Uh, and this is very much in the realm of, uh, this is ve very much, you know, al you know, algebra, number theory, arithmetic, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. But it's, uh, uh, but it's really, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that uh, if, you, if you learned these theories 100 years ago, you would be, you'd be a real visionary to suggest that there was any links between them, I think. Uh, you know, even though Ramanujan, but, I mean, it, Ramanujan knew that, Barry mentioned that the tau of n was congruent to sigma 11 of n, so, sigma 11 of n modulo 691. I mean, he must have, that's, so that's been known for now and 100 years now, but perhaps it was Sayre that first made the observation that, uh, I mean, I think it was. Didn't, didn't Sayre even write a paper that said uh, a new interpretation of this, where he, where he observed that this could be explained by postulating the existence of a link, you know, a, a bridge over this chasm. Uh, so, possible bridge. So, bridge. It's a one-way bridge. It's, it's going this way at the moment. Because uh, it took a long time. Historically, it took a long time to go, to go back. So, Eichler and Shimura. I mean, yeah, yeah, you see, Eichler and Shimura were, were, were pretty... In the Wake 2 case, there, there, were, there, were, there was evidence before, before sale, wasn't there? So we, 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 we have to mention Eichler and Shimura. I'm a terrible historian. I don't know why. I should never mention anyone's names, really. Eichler and Shimura. I, I'm bound to offend people. Uh, so Eichler and Shimura uh, constructed, from a weight two modular form, they managed to construct uh, an, an abelian variety, and, and its tape module was a Galois representation. And then for more general weight modular forms, we need the combined efforts of Deline and, and to finish the job, there, uh, they actually constructed, they actually constructed a path from here to here, given a normalised cuspidal eigenform. Uh, they, they actually, they actually came over here, and it was historically even later that people dared to start suggesting that there might be links going back. Which, we, and this bridge, they're just kind of putting the finishing construction on this bridge, is my understanding of it, but it's still not open yet. So, so open. There, opening soon. This, this one's going to go back this way. And, uh, and uh, the, the conjecture was made by Fontaine and Mazer. You see, I'm, I, the problem is I'm being slightly too vague. I mean, I should say exactly which Galois representations one expects to come from modular forms and exactly which modular forms. I mean, I, I, I'm being sufficiently vague, but, but these. They, they made the right conjecture, and, uh, and now there's, I mean, now I've got to be careful because now, and uh, there, there are people like Kissin and Emerton, uh, and, and, and 
Yeah, so I'm Bay and lots of other people. And you see, I'm in trouble now. I should never open this. Colmes and uh, Berger, and yeah, thank you for that. And, and, and there's there's lots lots of lots of people are are involved. But this is very. I mean, this the, this isn't finished yet. This is happening now, right? This is happening now. This 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 bridge the, this bridge the other way. But it's a it's a long. It's a big effort. It's a big effort building these bridges because because this is such. This is. You know, really an analytic theory, and, th and this is very much an algebraic theory. And to, before you even begin, one has to get some kind of algebraic interpretation of, of these guys. And in fact, you know, nowadays, nowadays this can really be embedded in a in an even more. Let, let me. Let, what should I do? Let me. Let me say. Let me say one fact. Let me. Let me tie it up with a. Let me tie it up with something that's. I've mentioned already, and then I'll go on to the then I'll go on to the more general thing. So the bridge, this bridge here, we have this modular forms here, and as I say, if we start here, we can get, we can at least go in this direction. Uh, these Galois representations, two-dimensional Galois representations, and here, as I say, we ha we have the we have the bridge already, so we can start with a modular form F, and we can we can construct. We, have, we can construct this representation rho f. So this is now a map from gal q bar over q to GL2 of some field of characteristic zero. I wasn't going to mention the p-adic numbers at, at this point, at least, because but I, I saw Barry talking about them freely. So, uh, so this is GL2 of a, of a p-adic field. And, uh, and what are the properties? What are the properties of this construction? Well, well, Barry mentioned some, but uh, so in in the weight two case, so this s f has a bad set, s of f, and and rho f also has a bad set, s of rho f, and when this construction was initially done, you know the, the first examples in the weight two case by Eichen and Shimura, the kind of things they proved. Right. And I should also say that if I'm going to do p-adic fields, I'm, I'm going to completely stay away from technical questions involving what's going on at p. So I'm, I'm not going to think about crystalline. I mean, the, the story is very well understood now, but I, I don't want to get involved in it now. The, the kind of thing that Eichner and Shimura proved is that if, if L was a prime and L wasn't in the bad set, and L wasn't in S of rho f either, you know, already it was a great, a great achievement to get, to get from analysis to arithmetic. But they, somehow their, their first attempt, that, you know, they, the, the Grothendieck revolution was only just beginning to happen. And to, to get much further than this, one really needs a very robust theory of, of, uh, you know, of, of, of algebraic varieties in characteristic zero and characteristic p. Something really, something somehow better than what they had, the, the way they had envisaged setting things up. One really needed some of the full force of what Grothendieck was doing, I think, to, to get much further than to get much further than this. Eichner and Shimura were, were kind of the last of the old school in some sense. They were, were working with Vase foundations. But they had this, and it took, and it took 20 odd years. Uh, so of course we have, we also have a conductor. I mean the reason I mentioned all this is we have a conductor here, n of f, and a conductor n of rho f. So this is the level of f, the level of the new form associated with f. And this is the conductor of the Galois representation. And uh, it took a very long time. Uh, it was actually proved by, I mean, I, th I think I'm right in saying that it wasn't until Carriol's thesis that one could actually deduce, even in this simple case, that, uh, that n of f was actually equal to n of rho f. You see, well, ideally, the, we want this association to be so strong that s of f equals s of rho f, and n of f equals n of rho f. So, so I, think, I think one should attribute to, to, a, theorem of, to a theorem of Deligne. Langlands and Carriol, I think, I really needed the full force of Carriol's work, as far as I know. Uh, is that N, in fact, in fact, n of f equals n of rho f. So, so in words, somehow f, i.e., f and rho f. So for a prime p, for a prime l, uh, f and rho f are kind of exactly as bad as each other 
as each other. That's L. There. So if one is one is on, if L is unramified for one, it's unramified for the other. As I say, I'm going to stay away. I'm really doing p-adic representations. So I'm going to stay away from p. But uh, you know, if, if 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 L divides n of f exactly once, then it divides n of rho f exactly once. So so that's so now we have theorems like this. We now begin to see that this is somehow how the world should fit together. And in fact, Carrie, really, they did, in some sense, they did much more than this. Uh, in fact, they, they saw much more subtle, they saw much more subtle invariants of f and rho f that somehow saw the conductor more. They saw, and in fact, you know, they, they really proved, you know, local, they, they proved a much stronger thing called local global compatibility. There, there, for L, for L not P. So they, so given F, they constructed a rather, I mean, it was, it was known how to construct a rather subtle, a rather subtle, the local component of F at L is some infinite dimensional representation, and they somehow, it matched exactly with the, with the representation. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated story, but, but that's what they did. But certainly as a consequence, the conductors match up. Uh, so now our more, the more general, let me, let me go back to the more general picture, because in fact, what, I need to mention the more general picture once more uh, to, re to kind of try and explain the, f the force of what Ken did. So the more generally, uh, so we have a, ah, so I, I, I need to mention the more general picture. So the more, more general picture. It's time, time to go on the board now. Instead of, instead of modular forms, we, we were kind of stuck with two-dimensional Gower representation. But, but what we really need What, what, what we really need is that uh, we really need to consider automorphic forms here. The world of analysis is a, so these are, these are the analytic objects. And we have a chasm which is, in, I mean, just as great and really in some sense great. Also, this is a generalization of modular forms. And even for the group GL2, there are automorphic forms that are of arithmetic interest that aren't modular forms. There are these. Um, non-holomorphic mass form. So again, we have the chasm. And if we work in this more general setting here, we don't just consider two-dimensional representations. We kind of now consider a much more arbitrary collection of kind of arbitrary you know, representations of Galois groups. Of a, of, you know, of a, so let, let me just write n-dimensional. If we, if we leave the world of modular forms and work in this more general setting, then we would expect to see, then we would expect to see a, a much more general class of representations of groups here. And again, here, the, I mean, it's somehow not only is it, you know, hope. This is a, this is a hope. Now, and 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 oh, well, I was going to say this is a dream. Yeah, this is okay. This is this is a dream, and, and maybe then this is a fantasy or something. <laughs> And, you know, I can envisage that in a hundred years' time this would all be known. And, you know, then a hundred years after that, everyone will have forgotten all the proofs. But, you know, that I happen to have been born now, and, and this is just, you know. So that, that's, that's, the, that's, that's what life looks like. And the reason I want to put myself into this setting is I now, I'm now in a very good position to be able to stress, to be able to stress some things. This chasm is so, you, you really, it's very hard to even see one side from the other. And... Uh, as a result, if we have, we, we, can, we can play little toys. This is, this is an easy side to understand. I mean, as an undergraduate in Cambridge, one learns, one learns Gower theory and one learns representation theory. And as a result, a Cambridge undergraduate can write down examples of gadgets on this right-hand side, whereas he has to stay another year and learn modular forms off Richard Taylor, if he's me, before he can start writing down examples of this side in some sense, or non-trivial examples. So here, here, so here we can, it's very easy to find examples. So one finds an example here. One finds a row, and, and, one, finds, and one finds a sigma. And one just says, actually, but now we've left the shackles of, of GL2, considering n-dimensional representations, we can, consider a, we can consider kind of a row plus sigma here. And, uh, and that's another representation of a group. And now on this side, we have some form f, some automorphic form f, and some automorphic form g, and let's say f gives us rho and g gives us sigma, and then we have rho plus sigma, there should be some automorphic form, or more specific, really, some automorphic representation. There should be some kind of f plus g 
that, that corresponds to it, right? If, if we can, you know, we go over here with the dream, we come back with the fantasy, and we've constructed F plus G. And this, in fact, the, this construction here, F and G goes to F plus G, this is a deep theorem of Langlands, this construction, in some sense. I think that's a... Let me, let me, let me say that the theory of Eisenstein series... Let me interpret the theory of Eisenstein series as doing this, even though perhaps it's not really... Let, let, me, let me not get bogged down in technicalities. Let me say that there's a, there's a, a very hard construction of... I mean, hard, I mean, it might not be hard. I don't know. I've never read it. I, it's incomprehensible, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> There's an incomprehensible construction of Lang. I, I, I mean, I know people that have read it. There's this incomprehensible construction of Langlands, which, uh, which, 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 the, the, which constructs, which constructs this. And now, in and yeah, tensor product. Thank you, Arthur. We can also we can also do row tensor sigma. And uh, so now that one, so given an f and a g here, we need an f plus g. But now we need an f times g. And as far as I know, this is a completely, com this is this is impossible. I mean. If, if rho and sigma are seven-dimensional representations, then rho tensor sigma is 49-dimensional, and I think is absolutely, absolutely out of reach. Am I right? I've got to be careful. I know nothing. Can one tensor product do... Can you do seven tensor seven? Do they know that seven sevens are 49? Locally. Okay, so... <laughs> so I think globally... Yeah, okay. Yes. No, I'm, I'm talking about globally. F, F, and, and, and globally, I think maybe we know that two twos are four and things like this. We, we, maybe we know something. We might not even know that. Two threes are six. Yeah. Okay, so an analyst can even prove two threes are six. But not seven sevens are 49. So this is very, this is only known, only constructed. Thank you, thank you very much. Only constructed in very few cases. So... That this, what's going on here is that this is, this is Langland's philosophy, right? And what's going on here is we're looking at, and, uh, and Langland's philosophy is, mo is, is motivating a lot of mathematics here, because what it's saying is that we can, we can see constructions on one side, and now if we believe, if we believe this, this dream, then we, then we get constructions on the other side that are completely not apparent from the theory, but we're, we're being inspired by, even if we can't prove these things, we're being inspired to do mathematics here uh, by, by, this, by this conjectural link. So, so Langland's philosophy, even though, as I say, in this generality, it's kind of completely hopeless to try and prove much. Oh, maybe I should say that for, certain, for automorphic forms on certain unitary groups, I'll, I think I'll, I'll finish going on about Langland's. Uh, I'll, I'll finish going on about Langland's by mentioning, so for unitary groups, for, cer for certain unitary groups, uh, this is the first, really, and I think the first class of general examples. What one worked, automorphic forms are attached to a group. So your automorphic forms on GL2, modular forms are examples of this. And, you know, Dirichlet characters are automorphic forms on GL1. But a unitary group, certain unitary groups, but you know, infinitely many of these guys, but for, for certain unitary groups, then, then, then we, can, we can realize our dream. We have, we have these papers by people like Clozel. And uh, I'm going to do it again. I've started mentioning names. Harris. Harris and Taylor, and, uh, and, and, and perhaps I should say Terry Yoshi Yoshida as well. This is very, I mean, the, the culmination in some sense of, of, this, of this story that I'm alluding to is a 1997 paper of Taylor and Yoshida, sorry, 2007, this is a very recent paper of two, Taylor and Yoshida where they, uh, they start off with an automorphic form and they, I mean, they, well, given an F, they attach a row and what Taylor and Yoshida do is that they prove local global. That, uh, so Taylor and Yoshida, Taylor and Yoshida prove that uh, rho of f is exactly as bad at, at the prime p as at the prime l as f is. Yeah. So this, as I say, this is in, the, in this generality, this is very much, very much, you know, modern mathematics. Uh, so, so everyone who's been to some general introductory lecture about Langland's philosophy has seen, has seen this, kind of, this kind of thing. So now I want to do something that is not covered by Langland's philosophy. I'm gonna take, I want to take our dream here. So, here's, so here's, our, here's our guess here. In fact, we can, go back to, we can go back to the simpler picture now. So let's go back to modular forms. And let's go back to two-dimensional Galois representations. Uh, and these are, these are interfields of characteristic zero. And I'll give you, so I'll, I'll now tell you something that isn't 
somehow an example of Langdon's philosophy. But it's, it's a, a, again, it's, it's very much motivated by this, by this, by this dream. So I'm going to change everything. And this is still, I think this is, I think this is still just about a conjecture. Uh, but what one can do here is one can reduce mod p. And uh, here, we're certainly not going over the chasm now, but here we have two-dimensional representations of Galois groups over fields, over fields of characteristic zero. I mean, they're, they're, they're p-adic fields, typically. We can reduce mod p. There's nothing mysterious about that. But we're going to get two-dimensional. So this is really not part of Langland's philosophy, but it's still motivated by the picture. We get two-dimensional mod p representations. Of, of Galois groups. And now the big, now a question that one might raise, uh, in fact, Sayre in his 1987, I mean, maybe it's raised explicitly before this, but Sayre raises, Sayre says that there are some questions uh, that one might ask, and one is a question for optimists, and one's a question for pessimists. And the question for optimists is, is there something here? Is there some kind of mod P theory? I mean, so is there some kind of mod p theory of, you know, uh, mod p theory of automorphic, rep you know, automorphic representations? So Langland says nothing about this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, or of modular of a... You see, even for GL... I don't want to oversimplify. Even for GL2, if you consider... If you don't just stick to modular forms, if you consider mass forms as well... Then, then it's very difficult to reduce such a gadget mod. You know, the, the basic problem is that the, the, the underlying definition here is some function, is some C-infinity function on the real points of some connected relative group. Right? This is yeah, satisfying lots of properties. So, and it's very difficult to reduce such a gadget mod P. So, so is, there some mod, is there some mod P theory of automorphic representations, you know, if I put for GL2? And if there was... Then we could hope that, you know, we could hope that there was, that there was connections here. And as I say, if, if you think about things in the generality, I set them up. The generality of automorphic forms and automorphic representations. It's very difficult to, it's very difficult to formulate, very difficult to formulate what's going on. So let me. Ah, uh, you see, and another problem is, what about if there's mod p representations of this group, that don't lift to characteristic zero? I mean, there's a map here. There's a reduced mod p map. But it's not injective or surjective or anything. There's probably good different representations which become the same mod p. And you know, on the other hand, if you take your favorite extension of Q with Galois group SL2 of F7, say, uh, then you could realize that as a finite Galois group, and you could map that. You know, that could go into GL2 of F7. But that's not going to lift to GL2 of Z7. Uh, that's an example in in, in Mays's paper about lifting Galois representations. That's never going to. That's, that's, you know, if you, it won't lift to, certainly the thing won't, won't lift here. And one wonders whether, you know, you can, li you can lift it at all. So this, this map here is a rather, I mean, any map factors as a surjection followed by an injection, right? So let me, so let me give up on this because somehow this doesn't exist. Let me factor this as a surjection followed by an injection. So here's a surjection. Uh, this is mod p representations mod p representations of Galois groups that lift a characteristic zero. Characteristic zero. And now after the surge action, uh, we can now inject. And, and now we can see, and now we see all mod p representations. So mod p representations. Galois groups. You know, good. So they exist there. And now on this side here, you see, I, as, I, as I'm trying to stress, there's no, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery, really. I mean, people are only just beginning to realize what should go here. I mean, certainly, I, I don't know of a natural definition somehow that lives purely within characteristic P. And uh, you'll get, you'll see classic, you know, you'll see mod P reductions of mass forms, for example, in here. But here, one can do something, because a surjection is just an equivalence, equivalence relation on the top, right? 
So we could look at modular forms. Modular equivalence. So that, that really exists, right? This set here. So the idea is f is equivalent to g if rho f mod p is isomorphic to rho g mod p. So, so at least here we have, we have a set, right? We have a set, and now one can, you know, one can, one can hope for some, one can, one can hope for some link here, and maybe we could even prove it by just somehow saying it's the, you know, it's the mod p reduction of everything we know above. So let me raise the following question: uh, What? How are we going to? How are we going to prove this basic fact about bad primes matching up? So we've got a mod p representation that happens to lift the characteristic zero. So we have a row bar here, and now we have a conductor of row bar. So if row bar's in there, the conductor of row bar, that's a, just a positive integer. And here, this is, you see, this isn't a proper definition. This is, this is, this is a fudge. <laughs> so now, how, how am I going to define, what's the, what's the level? The level of an equivalence class. See, I have, the, I have a, a modular form has a level, but how am I going to define the level? The problem is there's going to be lots and lots of modular forms, all of different levels. Yeah. So the level, let's define the level of f. The equivalence class to be the min, the min for g in the equivalence class, level of g. There. So I'm kind of working with an ad hoc set, so I've got an ad hoc definition, and now you see that the problem is you've got a represent. If you've got a representation here, you can have a representation here reducing to rho bar, and you can have the conductor of rho bar actually less than the conductor of rho. Degeneration can occur. So are these the same? And you see, this is, this is, this is going to be, this is a different question to the kind of, to the kind of Deline Langlands carryall kind of thing. Because, I don't know, this isn't such a great set. This isn't, su this isn't such a great definition. And so, so these are the same. There. So this is what Ken did. And, uh, and one hopes to kind of deduce it the, 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 so, so let's, let's stop and think about what needs to be done. So, so what needs to be done? So the idea is, so we'll start with f. So level n. And we'll go over, we'll go over the chasm. So get, we'll get some row f, which will have conductor n. Then we'll reduce mod p, then get, then get rho f bar of conductor, conductor m, which is less than or equal to n, and possibly less than m. Oh, it's just the same definition of the conductor. By, by definition, it's prime to p. If you're worried about, if I'm doing, if you're worried about p, it's by definition prime to p. We get rho f bar of conductor m less than or equal to n. And now hope, now what, ne what we need to do now is construct, need to construct uh, g on the left hand side such that, such that you know, f is congruent to g mod p. So as I say, we're very lucky in that for gl2 we can, we can make some sense of that. Uh, and the conductor of g, we can, uh, the level of g. You know, this is the practical question. That, uh, this is the practical question. That this is the way that Ken was somehow thinking about it at the time. Uh, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting to, to see that somehow really, that, that if you believe this Langlands philosophy, then we don't just deduce instances of functoriality. You can, we really open our minds. We can, in, you know, we can. Th this 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 this, this, uh, this link. So you're predicting more things. In the, should be confused. I get really yeah. slowly. Oh, I said row of f was equal, row of s isomorphic row of g. Yeah, those are the same statement. Well, okay, I'll. I'll. <laughs> Is that okay? So row f row f bar equals row g bar. They're all the same. As far as I'm concerned, they're all the same, and they're sufficiently vague. Yeah. 
Well, there are two. I can give you two definitions of what it means for two modular forms to be congruent. And, and this is one. And there's another one which is more precise that somehow even at the bad primes, things match up. And, and these are, and it's kind of slightly technical to, this is, this is what Ken did. So maybe I should say, this is, this is, this is what Ken did. This, so so I'll, I'll stick with that as my, as my definition. This is fine. This is, I think it's, what I have is, yeah. Uh, so the last thing I want to say is what? The last thing I want to say, oh yes, <laughs> is Fermat's last theorem. So I think uh, all, the, uh, all the experts can now somehow switch off because, so having, having said that what Ken was really doing is, you know, amplifying and extending Langland's conjectures for GL2, let me, let me, uh, here's a kind of an application. Here's a, here's a toy application. So let's say, let's say Fermat's last theorem was wrong. So, i.e., there exists some A, B, C uh, in Z, uh, and, and P some prime, let's say P at least 5, uh, P at least 5 prime, such that such that a to the power b plus b to the power p equals c to the power p. And let's furthermore demand that a, b, c is non-zero. So I'm kind of happy to let things be negative, uh, yeah, because as, as long as they're all non-zero. So now we consider, consider the elliptic curve. Uh, e defined by y squared is x times x minus a to the p, x minus a to the p, times x plus b to the p. And I should perhaps say that uh, I'll rig it, I'll permute a, b, and c. Uh, first of all, I'll divide them all by 2 until at least one of them's odd. And then I'll permute them so that b is even, and minus a to the p is 1 mod 4. Uh, which I think one can always do, yes, by changing signs if necessary. Uh, so now we have this observation of Fry. It's an extraordinary observation of Oh, so, the, the, so an elliptic curve has a tape module, and a tape module, and a tape module is a gamma representation. So a tape module of E uh, is a gamma representation. Is a characteristic zero gamma representation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I decided I wasn't going to say the word pianic in the entire talk. So. Don't, don't spoil it. Uh, tape module of E is a, is a characteristic zero gal representation. Let's call it rho. And the conductor of rho, the conductor of, well, let me talk about the bad set. So S of rho uh, is going to be, is it, uh, up to, I mean, S of rho will be the primes, will essentially, uh, will almost essentially be the P, such that the curve has got bad reduction at P. So these, the point A, B, you see, the, the, roots of this, the roots of this cubic are distinct, uh, but mod p roots might start, might start coinciding, so it's the p, such that p divides, p divides a, b, c. Am I in trouble? Oh, my goodness me, thank you. Here's the L, such that L divides a, b, c. Thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, I think that, you know, the, the conductor of rho will somehow be, you know, he's going to mention all of these things. But this observation of you know this observation of Fry essentially uh, the conductor of rho bar is two, <laughs> and that's because somehow the the rho bar the mod p reduction of rho involves kind of taking pth roots of things, but the, 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 we're full of pth powers, and taking pth roots of pth powers doesn't introduce any you know we had kind of remember we were looking at kind of z root seven earlier. And there was ramification at 7. But if we'd looked at, you know, z root 49, then there perhaps might not have been ramification at 7. <laughs> so, so somehow looking at, one can, one can check that rho bar, because we're only taking points of order p on this elliptic curve, this is 2. So now the observation was that if rho, so rho is on the right-hand side, rho is certainly on the right-hand side of our chasm. So if there exists, if there existed, I mean, if... You know, if, if there existed f 
on the left-hand side, such that such the rho was equal to rho f, then Kent's theorem gives us a contradiction. You modulo technicalities about the mod p representation being irreducible. Which is a, so he, he, one needs a, a big theorem of Mazer at this point, but uh, uh, then, Ken's, then Ken's theorem implies a contradiction because one can check that there are no appropriate level two modular forms uh, as, there's no, as there's no G, no appropriate G exists. G would have to have weight two and level two, and the only, the only such example is an Eisenstein series, which, which one can check explicitly doesn't work. So there's this kind of stunning application, but it's somehow much more than that. It's, it's much more than that because this, I mean, it's not a proof because we're missing a little, we're missing a little thing here. <laughs> and you see, it's the hard way, right? We, we, we've, got, we've got the representation, we need the modular form. But this is a conjecture, right? This was a well known, this is a conjecture. Uh, this was conjectured a long time before, 20 odd years before, uh, before Ken did what he did. So, so this is Shimura. Well, it used to be called Vey's conjecture, and then it became Shimura Taniyama <laughs> Vey. And then when Lang was around, it became Shimura Taniyama. And now Lang is dead, so I'm going to put Vey back. <laughs> If one, I mean, you look, you cannot. I'm waiting for this thunderclap. <laughs> but you read Vade's paper and you cannot underestimate the, the uh, you cannot underestimate Vade's contribution to this conjecture. So what's Ken, what Ken's done here is by, you know, by proving an explicit case of local global compatibility in the mod p Langlands program, he's, he's reduced a very classical question to a... I mean, what he's done two things, you see. Not only has he shown us how to prove Fermat's last theorem, he said all you've got to do is prove... The, but you can't prove Fermat's last theorem, right? It's impossible to prove it because it's just some random Diophantine equation that somehow has no links to modern number theory. That's what it looked like in the 1980s. And then suddenly Ken comes along and observes that this machine actually proves that Fermat's last theorem is a consequence you know, it was hinted, it was hinted by Fry that, such might, that this might be the case, but Ken really proves it. Fermat's last theorem was a consequence of this. And if it weren't for Ken's results, Fermat's last theorem would still be a conjecture, right? This is, this is, this, this is, this, op this opened the door, this opened the door to the proof. So that's one of the, this, you know, little, little paper in Inventiones. It opens the door to the proof of Fermat's last theorem. But not only that, it kind of tells you that there might be a mod P Langlands philosophy. And, and 20 years later, you, you realize that in fact, there's now, I mean now, one can really, there's this, there's, you know, there's this, there's this mod P automorphic form, mod automorphic forms. And nowadays there's even a, a theory of P, I mean, p automorphic forms. The, 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 for GL2, the, C, the C's of this were sown by Katz and, and Sayre in the, in the 1960s, but the theory was kind of developed and then, and then really somehow didn't, I mean, it was used to deduce various things, but then it sat for a while and didn't do anything. And then Heder suddenly came along and used the theory to great, you know, to, Heder came along and somehow revolutionized it. And then it somehow, in some sense, went a little bit quiet again. People used Heder's theory and then, and then Coleman came along and revolutionized the theory again. And now as people like, you know, Emerton and, and Kissin and others are, Somehow, this is, this is really happening now, and then this is supposed to be related to somehow to Pierre de representations. And all, and all the way, all the way, even now, one can formulate, Barry mentioned at the very end of his lecture, this thing about going from row to row bar is some kind of analogy of having a family of representations, row of t, and then specializing it in some row, row of t zero. And Barry observed that row of t zero might be behaving differently to the generic row of t, and you somehow need to capture in some other world the degeneracy here. And this is just the same here. You've got a family of, you should think of this as a family of representations of some conductor, and they degenerate to a representation that has a different conductor. And the question is, can, can one mimic this on the other side? So this raises the question about if you have families of a, if you have a family of, of Pianic Gower representations, and then one random point here, the conductor of rho zero is less than the conductor of rho, for row some conductor of row t, for row t a generic point here, then one can ask whether 
you know, if you're a family of gal representations, you can ask whether there's a family of automorphic forms that somehow gives, that gives rise to a family here. There is there, a, is there a sigma t here? A family here that the conductor of sigma t it really equals the conductor of sig you know, the conductor of rho zero, and sigma zero equals rho zero. And this question is being talked about at this conference by by Matthew Emerton. So that the idea, just like Barry said, the idea that Ken introduced, you know, years ago now, the idea he introduced is not dead by any means. People are using it again and again and again in various manifestations, and and. You know, it's, it, these people like Emerton and, uh, and, and Chenevier, they haven't specifically, and, and, and I guess Samet as well, just, they haven't specifically decided what they're going to talk about. You know, they haven't desperately tried to find some tenuous link to what Ken is doing. These people are actually taking Ken's idea. <laughs> 20 years later, these people are really using, they're proving theorems, the, the genesis of which somehow goes back to ideas of Ken. And that's kind of neat. So,